to the June issue of 30 Minutes with Linkspring. Uh, we have a lot of folks online, not sure where everybody's located, but uh, we are broadcasting live from Lee Summit, Missouri, as well as Richmond, Virginia. And if you're like where we are, it's hot. And uh, I like to bring that up because today's topic is very hot and hot in a good manner. So today um, we're going to be talking about data and analytics. And my name is Mark Petock, Vice President of Marketing at Linkspring. Again, thank you for joining us. A couple little housekeeping items. Yes, we are recording the webinar and will indeed make the deck available. Uh, in keeping with the theme, 30 minutes with Linkspring, Linkspring our job here today is to keep this at that 30 minute time limit. So as I mentioned earlier, today's topic is data and analytics. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, we all know that the importance of data today, that the information and stuff that we are gathering from various information systems, equipment, devices within our buildings is extremely important. There's never been a better time to take advantage of the huge amount of valuable data that's captured or can be captured within buildings uh, as the previous barriers, whether it be technologically or financially, have for the most part been all but eliminated uh, through various break, uh, breakthroughs in this field. Uh, data and analytics are in fact changing the way companies in every industry do business, manage business, and yes, it is in fact changing ours. It's changing the way buildings and facilities are managed and operated. Analytics truly enable us, you, and everyone to make the most of our data, and analytics gives buildings a voice. Analytics saves a fortune on maintenance and operating costs, energy costs, and many other things that John uh, will talk about here in a moment. Uh, and one thing uh, that I have found interesting uh, and in talking to folks within the analytics business and end user customers, system integrators, and equipment manufacturers is analytics truly finds problems you never knew were there. So at Linkspring, we're definitely seeing a change in attitude amongst the facility professionals with respect to analytics. With applications in over 10,000 buildings from colleges and universities, multi-site retail stores, commercial office buildings, fast food restaurants, government, military bases, hospitals, hotels, industrial facilities, SkySpark applications include building commissioning equipment, fault detection, energy analysis, load profiling, facility benchmarking, asset performance tracking, and carbon and greenhouse reporting. Uh, it's without further ado that I am delighted to introduce one of the industry's uh, truly experts in this field is John Petsy, principal and, uh, of Sky Foundry, who uh, is a Linkspring business partner, and uh, we have been uh, making SkySpark available as add-on to the Genesis operating system for many years now. And so I've asked John to give us an update and give us some additional insight into analytics and data. And without further ado, John, turn the show over to you. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Happy to have the chance to talk to you about this important subject. So, you know, let's really start there with, uh, you know, we hear a lot about data, we hear about big data, you know, what does it all mean to those of us who are involved with buildings, whether we're the building owners or operators or system integrators? And, you know, really the this, this simple description is this, you know, we can create value, generate money, save money by detecting patterns that represent faults or deviations, anomalies, and other opportunities for savings in our buildings. That's really the essence of what we're talking about when we talk about you know, how data and data analytics can be used to improve facility performance. And it really all starts with a very simple question. You know, 
do we really know how our building systems are operating? And uh, you know, think about that for a, or for a moment, right? Do we know how they're operating every second of the day, every valve, every damper, every sensor? And we think about it and be honest about it, that would be a huge challenge. What's really changing in the industry is why we care. Right? Building owners care more and more because there are a variety of factors pressing on them. One of them is that they need to manage and reduce operating costs. Increasingly, however, they need to meet regulatory requirements for either reporting data or confirming or validating the performance of their facilities. On the other side of the equation, though, they can increase the actual value of their building. There's proof, there's studies out there that show that efficient buildings have a higher asset value, all other things being equal, than non-efficient buildings. So that means more money to the bottom line when they're operating the building or selling it. Another important factor is increasing societal demands. Expectations that buildings are run efficiently, are managed well, and they're sustainable. So we have all these factors pushing on building owners and operators. And then we get back to our question, you know, how are we watching our buildings? You know, one of the things we find is that people, people will say, you know, well, I have a building automation system. I thought that's supposed to make everything right. And there's an interesting thing about a building automation system. You know, it's going to do exactly what it was set up and programmed to do. And that brings us to some key questions. Do we have people who could watch every sensor every second of the day and verify that what they're doing is correct? That the control strategies are well designed, that they actually implement the optimal control sequences? That the assumptions that those control sequences are based on were correct or still are correct? Because we know buildings go through lots of change, change in occupancy, change due to tenant fit out, et cetera. Also, who could confirm that they're still running as expected? Sensors haven't degraded, uh, valves haven't got stuck and won't close off, things haven't been overridden by uh, operating staffs in order to address some emergency or some problem. And the reality is that buildings are simply too complex today for this to be done by humans. There is too much data, too many systems, too much sophisticated complexity of all of these systems. So we can't do it just manually. And analytics is really a solution for that. Now, quite simply, analytics software is software designed to look at the data coming out of your equipment systems, your building automation systems, etc., and look for issues or patterns. Patterns in that data that represent uh, outright equipment faults, but also deviations from expected performance, or trends in the wrong directions, or comparison of actual results against goal, design goals, benchmarks, or other performance metrics. That's what analytics will do for us. And an interesting thing about analytics is that it's very much unlike a lot of the other you know, energy conservation measures and capital equipment uh, investments that building owners typically look at. Because it can be added to your existing systems. If you have relatively modern systems that have data, you can get the data out of them and now use these new software tools to automatically detect these issues, these patterns, and therefore be able to improve the operations of the building. Now we hear a lot of talk about this related to buildings, but as Mark said, if we look at the bigger picture, analytics is changing virtually every industry in our world. These are just some recent headlines from customer relationship analytics, to crime-fighting analytics, to sales improvement analytics. Throughout the world, we're all being subjected to analytics. Every piece of data that gets produced is going somewhere. And the big message now is that we can use this technology to improve our buildings. And that creates a real opportunity for those of us who are in the business of providing services to building owners. So let's just talk a moment about what it takes, what, what's involved in applying analytics to buildings. There's really three steps. The first step is to get data. So what data do you have out there? Do you have a building automation system? Great. Connect to it. Get the data out, out of it. You might do that via BACnet or OBIX or Sedona 
or Modbus or the new Haystack protocol. You might connect into an existing host software application and pull the data out with SQL, et cetera. So there's lots of ways to get building automation data, but actually it doesn't stop there. There's a lot of other data related to facilities. There's what we call asset data, right? The size of the building in square feet. Well, why would that be important? Well, that would allow us to normalize our energy consumption and look at performance, KW per square foot, KWH consumption per square foot. But there's also other asset or facility data, like the location or address of a building. That would allow us to go get weather data so that we can weather normalize our energy consumption, compare performance of our equipment to, energy, uh, to weather factors. But, and it goes on and on. We might want to compare the performance of different brands of equipment, different vendors, et cetera. Utility data is another important source of data, and it really demonstrates uh, different ways to get data. You might have a live feed from a smart meter from the utility company. You might have submeters coming in through your BAS. Or you might actually have years of energy data stored in Excel files or CSV files. All of that's useful data that can be brought in for analytics. We've talked about weather data, being able to bring in real-time updating weather data. And then another key component is production data, meaning what's the facility used for? For example, in a hospital, the production metric might be the number of beds that are full. In a commercial office building, it might be the amount of space that's leased or actually occupied if you have occupancy monitoring. All of those pieces of data can be brought in. They're brought in, they're normalized in a specialized database. And, and the way we do that is with something called tagging. And the way that tagging is done is uh, we follow the new industry standard called Project Haystack, which is a way for us to all mark up our data so that we know what it means, that it's all normalized and can be easily understood. Think about how a markup language works on a document. Well, the Haystack tagging methodology allows you to mark up your data. Well, once we have data, then the analytics can take over. And what we really are talking about here is an engine that processes rules or algorithms against the data to detect these patterns. And when they detect the patterns, they inform you what's been found. And that's really where the value comes in. So we can tag our data with Haystack tags. We can bring it into, we brought it into the system, and now the analytics engine can go through and detect issues. From simple to complex patterns, here's a simple example of detecting simultaneous heating and cooling that might be happening on a specific piece of equipment. Uh, it actually can happen more often than we might like to think. So here's an a example of a rule. It has a name for the uh, human being. Uh, it has a descriptor that tells what this rule runs against. In other words, it hunts down all the air handling units and then applies a rule function or an algorithm which says, hey, let's look for a period of intersection between heating and cooling both being true. So if it detects an issue, then, then the result is to create a spark. That's our terminology for having found something important. And that's when the real action takes over. The user interface side of analytics is really where the rubber meets the road, if you will. Right? You have this engine that's collecting data and automatically scanning data. Right? But in order to make that useful to operators, the software takes the next step. And this is a really important uh, advance in the world of software. You know, SkySpark Analytics is smart enough to automatically generate views on the issues that have been detected. So views that you're seeing here where you might have had to uh, build screens like this, using screen builder tools and graphing tools and assembling your graphics. With analytics, with SkySpark, the software is smart enough to automatically assemble these views so you can understand exactly what's happening. Let's take a look at this one here. Here we can see we've had two cycles of an issue. The issue is described over here. It happens to be the damper is open, the economizer, when it shouldn't be. We can see that we've had a short period of time where this occurred, and then we've had a longer period of time, so two cycles of this issue. Well, what the software has done is automatically assemble all of the relevant data to that issue. It grabbed the weather for the location where it was found. 
it's telling us that it was found in the specific site on this piece of equipment. And then it's grabbed all of the other I.O. data, the discharge pressure, the temperatures for discharge temperature, return temperature, zone temperature, etc. Then it's grabbed the control signal data for the control signal going to that damper actuator. And then at the bottom it's pulled together all of the on-off statuses of our heating and our cooling, our fan and our occupancy. It brings this all together in a view so that the operator can understand, here's my problem, here's how it's related to all of these other operating conditions and parameters. So what it creates is an ongoing expert analysis of the system and the delivery of the results in a way that building operation service people can take advantage of them. Now, for those of you that are system integrators out there, you know, you've got a tremendous amount of knowledge and skill uh, in your staff on uh, servicing buildings, understanding control systems. With SkySpark, you can convert that domain knowledge into value because you, every rule you build as you impart your knowledge into the software adds to your library of functions to look for different types of issues problems, deviations. You know, and these views can be high-level portfolio summaries. They can be what we call a detail page showing everything related to the occurrence of an issue. So what type of real issues do people find? Well, the list is nearly endless, but some examples. Simultaneous heating and cooling, uh, short cycling, uh, lack of diversity control if you're trying to maintain, uh, you know, let's think about a big box retail store and we want to have only four of eight units uh, running at any one time. You can set up a control program to do that, but can you confirm that it's working every moment of the day? Right? That's a pattern that the analytics can detect. A lot of the things analytics are used for are energy related. And you know, here we can make a comparison against um, more conventional energy tools. Right? There's energy analysis software packages out there that do a great job, but one of the things they require is for a knowledgeable human being to sit in front of those energy tools and pick options and chart and graph and slice and dice data. With automated analytics, what we're really talking about is letting the software do that for us. The software can calculate our energy metric, perhaps kW per square foot per degree day, and then take the next step and compare our actual use against a, a benchmark or a baseline or a design goal. And then it'll tell us things like when we deviated, and how often, and for how long, the duration of that deviation, and then the magnitude of that deviation, and even turn that into cost. One of the things SkySpark lets you do is add cost factors to these rules so that it will calculate the cost impact of these deviations or faults. A lot of things SkySparks use for are considered fault detection. That's really a subcategory of analytics, right? We're talking about detecting things like outright faults of equipment, but how about trends in the wrong direction? You know, think about degradation of heating or cooling performance. Uh, maybe I expect eight degrees of delta T across a coil, but today I'm only getting four degrees. Well, actually, today up in Virginia, it's not that hot a day. It's kind of a mild day. And so, you know what, four degrees of delta T on the coil may be able to maintain space temperatures. But what happens when the heat wave Mark's having out in Kansas City reaches Virginia? We're not going to be able to maintain the space with only four degrees of delta T across the coil. And that's an example of what are considered predictive rules, right? It's not telling you, hey, tomorrow at 3.45 p.m. you're going to have a problem, but it's showing you this is a future problem. Right? Everything's fine today. You're not getting any alarms. So you're not going to be able to maintain temperatures coming, going forward. Uh, some of the things are outright faults. Economizers open when they shouldn't be. Non-functioning sensors. Uh, this is pretty interesting because there's some amazing impacts from non-functioning sensors that you wouldn't think could happen. Uh, lights and other loads operating when they shouldn't. You know, things that have been overridden. And a key point we make is, you know, all buildings are different. What might be improper operation on one system could be exactly what you expect on another one. So a key point about SkySpark is that it's programmable, just like those of you on the call that are system integrators are all using programmable building automation systems so you can develop sequences that fit the building needs. The analytics with SkySpark are programmable. They're in your hands. 
So, you know, analytics can do some wonderful things for you, but, you know, one of the questions we get when we, we talk to people about it is, well, well this all sounds, sounds good, but what's involved to implement analytics? And we wanted to touch on this today, considering the type of audience that, uh, you know, LinkSpring has in, in their channel partners. You know? So the first thing you're going to need is to get some data. It could be live data via BACnet or Modbus or Obix or Paystack, et cetera. But it could also be batch loading of SQL data or Excel data or CSV data or XML data. And you can get tremendous analytic results with historical data as well. But the next thing that's involved is you need to understand the systems you want to look at. Right? There are lots of standard rules, standard things you can look for. But the best results are really when you understand the systems. Think about how many different chiller plant designs you may have seen over the years, different air handlers that work different ways. It's important to use your skill to tailor the rules to find real issues on the real equipment for the real building design. The next thing, though, is less technical. It really relates to your solution model for the customer. Right? You could implement analytics for the end user. Right? They could you put it in front of them just like you may put the BAS front end in front of them. You could train them to use it, and their operating staffs could use it on a daily basis. But as we know, many buildings don't have those staffs anymore, so another business model or solution model is to deliver it as a service, where you provide ongoing consulting. And the other thing you can do is you can integrate the analytic results with your BAS, integrate it with the graphics so that you have the picture of the air handler and the analytic results. So there's a number of things involved that you need to think about if you're going to start delivering analytics to your customers. Some of the other things that come up, you know, common questions we get, you know, how much will analytics save? Well, an interesting thing about analytics is it's not like an LED light bulb, right? You can't say, well, if I put this light bulb in instead of this one, I save this many watts and this many dollars. You know, analytics is actually finding issues and providing us information. So until you have the analytic results, you don't really know what are the issues in the buildings that are going to present themselves for savings. So the sales process has to be different. Uh, we have lots of case studies and examples that help, but, you know, Analytics, you know, determining the savings is an interesting challenge. And here's the other part of that challenge. Analytics finds the issues, but only if you do it, if you address them, are you going to actually get those savings. Another question is, what skill set do I need if I'm an end user, a system integrator, or an energy engineer, right? If I'm an end user, do I have people who understand equipment in my building? Or is that something I outsource? If I'm a system integrator, am I involved in integrating systems and I'm involved in um, you know, programming systems for optimal efficiency, or am I just you know, doing the more conventional bid and spec work? Am I an energy engineer where I'm going to use these tools to analyze and investigate energy-related issues? So quick summary on what's involved, you know, scope the project. How deep do you want to go? You could start very easy, like with just energy meter data. We have some great case studies on people who just start with the meter data, apply basic analytics to identify all different types of things. So there's a link to a great case study um, that had rapid return on investment and rapid value. We encourage people that analytics is a journey. It's, and don't start with a huge science project. Start by generating results quickly. And the goal with analytics is really to generate financial return for everybody from the customer and obviously the service provider there. So what data do you have? How can you get value out of that data? So analytics, you know, it really gets down to the old adage, you can't control what you don't measure. BAS systems measure a temperature. Analytics measure overall performance, efficiency, and operational performance of your systems. It enables you to understand how your buildings are really operating. And I guess the final thought I'd leave you with is that the data coming from these systems is really a new form of money. It's really a new form of value. It's changing the industry. And we see it changing the business and business models for system integrators and specialty consulting firms out there. If you're not already involved with analytics, you know, uh, both ourselves and LinkSpring would be happy to talk with you to help you understand how can you use these tools, what will they do, what is it going to take, 
and what type of value can I deliver to my customers. So Mark, I want to leave some time for questions. I'm going to turn it uh, back over to you to see if you've got any questions that have come in. Perfect, John. Thanks again. We appreciate the, uh, the presentation. Yes, in fact, we, we've got several questions. So first question, John, uh, from our audience, does SkySpark rectify or take any action other than to notify? Yeah, that's a great, an excellent question. We get that question too. So SkySpark has the ability to write back to a BAS to issue a command. BACnet's a two-way protocol. SkySpark can detect an issue. Your, your rule can say if you detect this, issue this command. But be, before we get overly excited about that, which it can do, and people are using it, especially in areas of demand response and load management, we have to think about the types of issues that are being found. Mark, I found the sensor is broken. There's no command to fix that. I found that the valve won't close. It's stuck. There's no command to fix that. So yes, the analytics are capable of identifying issues and issuing commands back, but you really need to think out the use case. Can these types of issues actually be fixed by, fixed by sending some command down the wire? And what we found historically in 10,000 buildings that the vast majority of them, there is no command that will fix it. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, another question. What's the difference between an alarm and a spark? Sure. So, yeah, you know, what's the difference between sparks, which you, to us, you know, that's our term for having found an issue in the data. And, and a quick example of that, and we have a white paper that talks about this too, available on our site. It's called Understanding the Difference in the Data-Oriented Tools Available to Facility Managers. But it's really this. Alarms are typically focused on one thing. A sensor value against the limit at a specific period of time now. So Mark, your temperature is over your alarm limit. Well, that's kind of great. Wouldn't it have been nice to spot the trend for the last day or hour that's led to that? Analytics are looking for patterns in the data, not just a simple event, right? Detect those patterns with much richer information. Another example, you know, I would say is, you know, lots of people turn off alarms because they get what's called cascading alarms, right? You have one issue, but you get 5,700 alarms. Analytics detects the real patterns and will dramatically reduce and eliminate all of that noise. And a final analogy I'd make on that question, Mark, I'll put it this way, right? An alarm means you're in the emergency room on a gurney and somebody's putting a tube in you. Analytics are the health tests you have during a year that say, hey, your blood pressure is getting a little high, you should lose, lose a few pounds, et cetera. That's what we want to be doing, is looking at the performance of our systems before we're in alarm. Good. And actually, John, that your answer to your last part of that really hit close to home for me. Good example. So I uh, do appreciate that. A couple other questions. Uh, what are some of the challenges of getting started with analytics as you, as you been out in the marketplace and seen this over the years. You know, this is interesting. Everybody immediately focuses on, oh, what's it going to take? How will I learn how to write rules, you know, or use the rules in your library? And interestingly enough, and it's actually been confirmed by an independent study, the biggest hurdle is getting data. You know, if you are a system integrator and you work with one brand of system, hopefully Genesis, right, you know that system inside and out and you know how to how to work with the data. But now you want to pull data from that system, from a metering system, from CSV files, a database. You want to pull it into an application. And it's an area that many um, system integrators haven't had a lot of experience with. So getting the data, uh, we know a consulting engineering firm who did a study on a number of analytic projects that they were involved in. And their um, finding were that 70% of the cost went into acquiring and onboarding data. So don't underestimate that. Well, ask yourself, what data is available? Where is it located? How do I connect? And when I connect, how is it described or documented? Which gets into the tagging. Because you might find, we had an interesting example that it took one of our, our partners, it took them two months to get the IT permissions to connect to the data that they thought they were going to get in day one. Two months of waiting around. So that is the first challenge. Um, the second uh, challenge is, you know, understanding those systems, right? You want to, you know, if I'm going to apply good analytic rules to a chiller plant, right, 
talk about different designs, right, chill plants of all different designs, I need to understand what is appropriate operation that fits the design and control sequences. So that's actually a great thing for system integrators. Here's a place for you to really uh, utilize and um, leverage all your experience. Hey, John, uh, just a quick follow-up on when you cited the independent study, uh, uh, a question from one of our listeners. Can you cite the independent studies reference that you've just mentioned? I, I can't. I, that was actually done by an uh, uh, engineering consulting firm um, for their customers, and I don't have the authority to do that. But because we had been um, the successful bidder on a number of projects, they actually shared with us. Because they're trying to see how, how can we make it easier and lower cost to actually get to the value. Um, and it mm -hmm. actually came came back around to Project Haystack, believe it or not, one of the big challenges is how do we normalize this data in a consistent way, which is what Project Haystack uh, is for, right, so that we can all mark up our data. But I didn't do this study, and I, and I actually can't um, provide the names. Sorry. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Two more quick questions. Uh, back to, uh, the spark, uh, to a spark. When does a Spark notify? Instantaneously, weekly, monthly, or can you set it up however you want? Um, I think uh, just kind of go in briefly concerning that, please. Yeah, that, okay, and another great question. So, you know, let's just go back to the screen briefly. These views are always available in the product. So if I come in, it's 8 in the morning, and with my cup of coffee, and I open the software, I'm going to see my Sparks. I might see it of a portfolio view of all of my buildings, all the different issues. And I might click on one to drill down to the specific information. But in addition to the view in your browser, the system has the ability to notify you. It can send emails. It could send an email automatically on detection of the issue. So once that pattern has been found, it can send an email to tell you that's happened. One of the most common things, actually, is a daily digest. It can send a daily summary. When we're talking about analytics and patterns that are forming over time, right, it's really you know, not about alarms. And we found one of the most effective things is for people to consume a digest, which might be hourly, daily, you know, twice a day, whatever. Uh, that digest can be sent to them in their email. And it includes live links that they can just click on and come back to these views. Uh, obviously, assuming they have uh, password access. Gotcha. All right, just to, to firm up one more, and uh, it's an interesting question for sure uh, from one of our listeners. Um, how is the how is SkySpark and the Sky Foundry solution different? If you're kind of looking at uh, the JCI Panoptics and the uh, Honeywell Attune type of analytic uh, offerings that are out there. Okay, you know, um, there's a lot of, as you started the conversation, there's a lot of noise and buzz and activity in this area. And, you know, for us as, uh, you know, ourselves biased with our product, uh, to try to compare to all of the different uh, new entrants, what we, the, we, we, the way we answer that question is this. Come to one of our weekly demonstration webcasts. We do a 90-minute, very thorough, live demonstration. Here's how it works. Here's what it does. And then compare that. If you're an end customer or system integrator, uh, all of the other vendors should be happy to be and willing to show you how they do analytics. Uh, we're very open. We say start there. That'll give you the ability to start comparing against the other technologies. That said, I'll focus on two quick differences. The first one is SkySpark can be installed locally. It isn't just a cloud solution. You can put it inside the building, inside their secure networks a big concern in today's era of security issues. Or you can offer it as a cloud-based solution. So you can do both. With SkySpark, almost all of the other solutions are cloud-based only, which means the owner has to turn their data over to some external organization, which may or may not be acceptable. With SkySpark, you can do either. The other one is SkySpark's fully programmable by you, the system integrator, the building expert, the specialty engineering firm. We have an extensive library of analytic functions, but the reality is one size does not fit all. Could you imagine deploying a control system today that only had factory-built algorithms? And the third one is our business model, right? 
Sky Foundry doesn't sell direct to end customers. We sell through authorized partners. Again, Linkspring is one of our value-added distributors, and they run a value-added reseller program. So we provide you, the system integrators and especially the engineering firms, the tools to deliver analytics to your customers. We are never competing with you. Okay, thanks, John. We're wrapping up. So for the folks, uh, you know, Linkspring has really made it easy to add and integrate SkySpark to the Genesis operating system. And for further augmenting the functionality and extending the value of the Genesis platform, uh, I want to give thanks to John for a awesome uh, job in presenting uh, the latest in data and analytics in SkySpark. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar. We have recorded it, and we'll be sending out an email uh, with that, as well as if you're interested in receiving uh, John's deck. If you email me, mark, M-A-R-C, dot, P-E-T-O-C-K, P -E -T -O -C -K, at linkspring.com, I will be more than happy to send you John's deck from today. And finally, just please make a, make a note on your calendars. Next month's 30 Minutes with Linkspring is going to take place on Wednesday, July the 20th and we'll be sending more information forthcoming. So again, my thanks to everybody who has joined us, and especially you, John. Thank you. We'll see you all next time. Thanks, John.